share my screen here. Give me one second. And then I'm going to talk about another way that you can reduce some of the um, friction. And that's by addressing accessibility. All right. So hopefully you all can see my uh, screen there. So um, I work at the National AIM Center, the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. So first of all, a plug for my employer. See how I did that there at the beginning? Um, and we have a page on our site, um, or a section actually, called Designing for Accessibility with POUR, P-O-U-R. And those, that acronym actually stands for four principles of accessibility, sort of the four pillars of an accessible learning experience, which is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And it's really what we're aiming for. Those are the big areas that we're aiming for and when we try to make something accessible. And so I'm happy to report that recently we came up with some icons for each of these principles. So very briefly, I'll explain what each of them uh, is. So perceivable, we want to make sure that everybody can acquire the information in the format that makes the most sense for them. Uh, so for somebody that may be Braille, for another person that may be a video with captions turned on, for another it may be text-to-speech, uh, or it could be that on a device like an iPad or an iPhone, they can adjust the text size uh, because the text has been designed in such a way that that is possible. Like using a format like EPUB, you can adjust the text size. So the idea is that you're not relying on one of the senses alone. You're providing some options there for how people um, access the information, which modalities they can use. Uh, so some of the things you can do, of course, is you can add descriptions for images uh, so that if somebody is blind, they can hear that description read aloud with text-to-speech. You can provide captions or transcripts for videos. So again, if you can't hear the audio, you can still follow along with the captions. Um, and that's a great example of really good design because it's not just the person who can't hear the audio that benefits. It's also the English language learner or the person who's learning a new topic, right, that has specialized vocabulary and may benefit from the reinforcement of seeing that text on the screen as well as hearing it. And, and color contrast. You already mentioned that, Alicia. So making sure that, um, you know, you're not struggling to see that text against a busy or uh, background or a background that doesn't provide sufficient contrast. So perceivable again is about how we acquire that information. Operable is how we interact with it, how we navigate the content, how we respond. And again, we're trying to make sure that we're not relying on one single input method because one single input method won't work from it for everybody. Uh, so it's not just the mouse or uh, touch gestures on an, uh, an iPad, but it's also switch access or keyboard shortcuts, or uh, flexible navigation options on a book, like the table of contents, so that you can jump just right to the section that you want. Uh, understandable is much more about language support. So you all know in education, we love acronyms. Um, I was at a meeting in DC this past week, and man, were they throwing around acronyms like crazy. And, but if you're not part of the in crowd, right, uh, you don't know what those acronyms stand for. So the first time that you use it, describe it. <laughs> Explain what it stands for. And the same thing with avoiding the use of jargon, right? Because that leaves out some people. So that's part of design too. That's part of that friction, right? That Kendra was mentioning. So if you're struggling to make sense of that term, then it takes away from the attention that you could focus on the rest of the content. And then finally, robust is just basically making sure that it works across platforms because most of us now are accessing the content not just on um, you know, uh, desktops, but also on mobile devices and um, who knows in the future what the interface will be. Maybe directly connected to our brains, who knows. <laughs> but it's making sure that you do some testing to make sure that you're following accessibility best practices. So what I want to do here is just, um, I know you're not all web designers, but I want to show you some tools that you can use so that when you're evaluating a website or an application on the web, you can do some really basic testing. So the first uh, tool that I want to share with you is something called Totally. And it's actually, um, in case you don't know, A11.Y on the web, it's a shorthand for accessibility. 
And it's because there are 11 letters between the letter A and the letter Y in accessibility. So this extension or this application called Totally, it's really about A11.Y. And it's from our good friends at Khan Academy. So Kendra, you were picking on them for dark design earlier. Now I'm gonna give them a little bit of credit. See, so we're balancing it out. So here's what Totally does. Um, it's basically a little bookmarklet that you add into your web browser. So you can see it here where I'm kind of uh, uh, hovering with my mouse. So when you get to a website that you want to work on, what you do is you click that bookmarklet. Let's try that again. Let me see, for some reason I'm not seeing it here. There it is. I just needed to move my uh, window a little bit up. And then you'll see this eyeglasses at the bottom of the uh, screen. Hopefully you all can see that. I'm just hovering my mouse cursor there. And so then what I can do is I didn't want to pick on anybody. So I went to the W3C and they have something called the before and after demonstration. So this is a really bad web page on purpose and a really good web page again on purpose. So it's just used for training purposes. So with a really bad web page, I'm going to use my uh, totally extension. And one of the things I want to check for is to make sure that all of the images have a description. So if I select that option, now I can hover any of these images on the page and it tells me that it's missing alt text. So alt text is that alternative that again, a screen reader could read to somebody who is blind and can describe that image to them. So that's something that I would look for here, is any images that are missing that alt text. Otherwise, this content is only gonna work for those people that can see it. For the other people, it's gonna be, the, uh, uh, what do we call it, gray design? More leaning towards dark design, I would say, but okay, at least gray design. And it also creates a lot of friction for them, right? Because it takes the focus away from the learning. The other thing we can do here is we can highlight the headings. And we can see on this page, it looks like we have a ton of headings. But when I select the option in totally, it doesn't highlight any of them because what the designer did is they selected the text and then they just changed the appearance of the text. But they didn't mark it up correctly. Now let's go to the good page. So bad page, good page, bad page, good page. So on the good page, I'll do the same thing. I'll turn on totally. And then let's do the same thing. I'm gonna turn on the headings. And now you can see that we have annotations that say H1, H2, and so on. So on any web page or any document, you wanna have a single H1. That's the main idea of that document. So right away when I glance at the page, I should know what this web page or document is all about. And then the subsections are then marked up as heading level two to indicate that they're a level down in the hierarchy. And the reason why these are important is screen readers create a lot of friction. Uh, with a screen reader, you have to access the page from top to bottom, left to right. And so what people have done over the years is they've added some landmarks on the page. One of those landmarks is the headings when they're properly marked up. The headings allow a screen reader user to jump around on the page and go to any section that they want or they can bring up a list of all of the headings and kind of get an idea of how the web page is organized and then jump to any of those sections as needed. So just by doing that, by making sure that these headings are marked up correctly, we can decrease that you know, friction that uh, people would encounter on this page. Alicia mentioned contrast. Well, in here we have a contrast checker as well. And so it tells us which uh, items on the page pass for contrast. Anything that's green here passes for contrast. If I go back to my other page, so let's go back to the bad one here and turn on contrast, you can see here that there is one that does not pass. And so it's marked up uh, to indicate that. So just, this is not an accessibility checker. It's a visualizer to help you learn about accessibility. So you can learn about the headings markup. You can learn about the contrast. Um, you can learn about images that are missing alt text or form elements that don't have labels on them. So it's a great tool for getting started 
uh, with that uh, accessibility on the web. So the last thing here, the next tool that I want to show you is we're going to, I'm going to issue a challenge to you. And it's called the no mouse challenge. So one of the most simple accessibility tests you can perform is if you go to a web page or a web application and then pretend that your mouse doesn't work, you can even flip it over. And then on your keyboard, just press the tab key a few times. See what happened the first time I pressed the tab key, if you look on the upper right hand corner of the screen, something showed up. I'll do that again. It's a skip to main content link. So that allows me to skip all of the navigation on this page and go right to the most important thing on the page. And then as I tab through, you're gonna see some of the items are gonna be highlighted. So now take a look at services at the top of the page. And watch what happens as I press the tab key. Right now, services is red, but if I press tab, it will be articles. Tab again, resources. Tab again, community. And that's called knowing where the focus is. So as I tab or shift tab, I should know at all times which part of the screen has the focus on it. So the no mouse cursor is a great way to get some awareness of the structure of your content and whether it's keyboard accessible. And not only should it be keyboard accessible, but um, if you make a keyboard accessible, be accessible to other people that use things that are like the keyboard, like switch interfaces. So you should be able to, the key here is you should be able to get to everything with the keyboard. You should go through the options and everything through the keyboard and you should be able to get out of everything with a keyboard. So there shouldn't be a trap anywhere as you're using the keyboard. So this is a great way to test how operable is your website or your web app. And then language. Language is one that we take for granted. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is just grab a little bit of text and copy it and show you one of my favorite apps that I use. It's a web app. It's called the Hemingway app. So with a Hemingway app, you can come in here, you can paste your text, and then it tells you what the grade level is. And then it gives you some hints for how you can rewrite that text so that it's much easier to read. So this is part of that understandable principle. And generally you want for the, for the general public, you want it to be at around a ninth grade reading level. So that means that you're avoiding uh, too much jargon, too many specialized terms uh, in the text. So we've looked at perceivable, operable, understandable. The last thing that I wanna cover here is robust and show you um, that this doesn't just apply to websites, it also applies to documents. So in here, I'm in Google Docs and I wanna show you one of my favorite add-ons for Google Docs and it's free. It's something called, let's see, Grackle Docs. So with Grackle Docs, you can launch it and it will do an accessibility check of your Google Docs. It also works in slides, it works in sheets, and it will tell you what it finds and then it gives you information about how you can fix it. So any good accessibility checker should not just be about checking, it should be about learning as well. So you should be learning not just what's wrong, but how to fix it. So that is again available any, anywhere in G Suite, right? So Google Docs, Slides, Sheets, you can run that accessibility checker and learn a lot more about what you need to fix. In Microsoft Office, so if I bring up my uh, PowerPoint here and open up a recent document that I have, that's assuming we don't get a beach ball. So I'm gonna open up this document, hopefully. Microsoft Office also has a great accessibility checker. So if you go to the review tab, you can check accessibility. And again, it not only gives you what it found that you need to fix, but also how to fix it. So if I select any of these, I get an explanation of why I should fix it and what the steps are to fix it. 
So just by doing a quick check with something like Rackle Docs or with the built-in accessibility checkers, you can get some of these errors that, again, they're going to stop somebody from getting the most of it out of that learning content. Um, Dr. David Rose, um, whom some of you probably know, he was the originator of Universal, one of the originators of Universal Design for Learning. Um, he shared an expression the other day that I, I think is really appropriate. Desirable difficulties. So what we want to do with our learning designs is create desirable difficulties. What that means is that the desirable difficulty is part of learning, right? It shouldn't be easy. <laughs> if it's too easy, then you're not learning. There should be some challenge involved. But we don't want those undesirable difficulties that have to do with the design or that have to do with accessibility barriers because those don't have anything to do with learning. They actually detract from it. All right, so we have a few minutes here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I will turn it over to you. Let's see if we have any questions um, or any comments. So let's see, Cindy says, grandson in preschool is colorblind. So colors again, so which colors, right? Uh, red and green are sometimes difficult for some people, especially males, it's more prevalent among males. And so you don't want to design an interface where it says, you know, click on green to go and red to go back or something like that, because somebody may not be able to notice those colors. So you want to add a shape or something else or a label uh, that makes that distinction. Glad to have you back, Alicia. Sorry that you got kicked out. Let's see who else. Um, the no miles is a fantastic test. Um, I think that was you, Alicia. Your name is cut off. Exactly. Flip that mouse around and see if you can use it with just the keyboard. It's going to give you a great appreciation for good design. <laughs> uh, Susie, I think. What kind of UX research has been done on voting machines? I don't quite get the scroll ball and click interface. Um, yeah, that is an area that has been really touchy in the last few years. And there have been some lawsuits around that. Uh, because, um, you know, not everybody can bubble in those spots on the, uh, uh, the voting sheets that they give you. But then again, if we go to machines, there are some issues with that as well. Um, you know, bad design could cause you to not be able to vote or the machines could be hacked. <laughs> so um, there's some issues there that need to be considered. So definitely I'll see if I can find one of those articles that talks about, you know, voting and accessibility because that's important uh, for everyone to be able to participate in, in our elections. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so definitely one of the points coming through here is the, you need to have a variety of options because no single uh, thing is going to be perfect for everybody. In fact, we can't actually have 100% accessibility, right? Because we vary. We're very complex um, beings and with very complex needs. But what we can do is make something more accessible and better. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked me to, for checking accessibility in a Google Doc. Uh, so it's a free add-on. It's called Grackle Docs. So if you go to uh, your add-on store in Google Docs or you can just go to the website. I'll, I'll post it here. I'll just mention it again. It's Grackle Docs. You can do a search for that, and then it will show you how to install those. And actually, Kendra just shared it right before me. So it's something that doesn't come installed by default. You have to add it uh, to your Google Docs. Typing, uh, Dr. Anderson here says, yeah, it can be quite painful for some people. So something like um, speech, right? But uh, the new standards have been updated to account for the fact that, you know, we need to design for that as well. We need to design for speech. Uh, one of the problems is um, you can have keyboard shortcuts 
on some of these websites or some of these applications that when you try to use text to speech or speech recognition, it can trigger some of those shortcuts. So you might say, you know, hi, Tom. And if the keyboard shortcut is H, <laughs> then it will do whatever H does. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, she talked about eye gaze. So the ability to use your eyes to control the interface. Uh, but again, there is a cost to that, right? It can be a little bit slow and it can require quite a bit of effort. So let's see, it's 8.31. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for a couple of minutes here, see if there are any last minute questions. Uh, Kendra, uh, any last minute comments? Or Alicia, if you're um, back on with us. No, I just think uh, what we talked about, there's, you know, for me, the Alicia's talking about, you know, the gray areas. I think that really aligns to the friction and then the oil. And I think uh, what you looked at was really, you know, that, that high level of accessibility that we need to be thinking of as well. So um, I think they all kind of tie together really nicely. It's like we planned it. Yeah, it's almost like we planned that or something, right? <laughs> That's because the, the three items, UX, LX, and accessibility, um, really are about, if I'd had to boil it down to one word, it's empathy. Design with empathy. So it's really thinking about, you know, the variability that's out there that you're designing for. You're not designing for just one person. You're designing for a range of people and keeping that in mind. And Alicia says, hallelujah. <laughs> All right, everybody, last chance, last call. Any last minute questions or comments, share them in the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, so the next steps is um, I'm going to stop the recording, wait for it to be saved to my computer, and then um, we will share this uh, probably over the weekend on the Inclusive Learning Network page, and then I will include the links, uh, each of our presenters, including the ones that I shared uh, underneath the video. So you'll see everything that we mentioned tonight will be available to you there. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for joining us, and we hope to see you on another Inclusive Learning Network webinar real soon. Have a great rest of your Thursday evening and a great weekend. Love you all. Thank you.